The 1990s was a golden era in football, one in which the number 10s in Serie A thrived. It was a period in which Mavericks were allowed to flourish and where attacking luxuries were often indulged. Alessandro Del Piero, Roberto Baggio, and Francesco Totti flew the Italian flag, while the likes of the great Zinedine Zidane and Jorge Hagi ensured the league's foreign contingent was well represented. Yet the league never saw anyone quite like Manuel Rui Costa. He was special, one amongst the very few of now a rare breed. He helped define a decade few will forget. In the famously defensive Serie A, the Portuguese playmaker commanded a swashbuckling attacking presence and did things most footballers could only dream of. The lanky midfielder, with slicked hair and rolled down socks, brought the fun factor to the league, skillfully gliding past defenders, delivering pinpoint passes at pace, and finishing chances with envious aplomb. He had everything. Rui Costa was born in 1972 in Lisbon, a football-obsessed city, and it's no surprise his family were season ticket holders at a famous Portuguese club, Benfica. At the age of nine, something incredible happened. The club organized an event for season ticket holders where the kids would get to come over for a day and play in their training complex. It wasn't a trial. It was a way to say thank you to the fans. Costa was among the almost 500 kids who participated and he saw a chance to impress. Eusebio, Portugal's greatest player ever, was in charge of the session, picking 22 kids at a time so that each could get to play for 10 minutes. Eventually, it was Rui Costa's turn. He stepped onto the pitch and with his first two touches, left two kids laying on the pitch behind him. He was that good. Eusebio approached Costa's father and asked him to bring a young Costa back to the club the following day. And a few days later, Costa played his first game for Benfica, and that's how his journey to the top started. But it was never going to be all rosy. At the age of 19, with his youth contract coming to an end, Benfica wasn't sure he was good enough and that they would let him leave. At that point, he was called up for a youth match against FC Porto, and that's where he was spotted by scouts from third-tier club Fafe, who were present hoping to get some players on loan from Porto. But the club's president, Pinto da Costa, stood them up and the meeting never took place. They ended up with Costa, and that's how, without meaning to, the FC Porto president stopped Benfica from wasting Costa's talent. He was part of the Portugal under-21 team that won the 1991 World Cup, memorably scoring the winning penalty against Brazil. After his showing at the tournament, he was introduced into the senior team at the club the following season, and he made quite an impact. His first touch and ability to operate in tight spaces stood out. He became a household name, playing alongside João Pinto in midfield, and the duo helped Benfica to the Taca de Portugal success in 1993 before tasting Primera Liga success the following season, one that turned out to be Costa's last in the famous colors of his beloved Benfica. The club was forced to cash in on Costa to help them navigate financial difficulties. First, Barcelona got the deal done for Costa, but with only the signature left, Benfica pulled back and demanded 5.5 million euros. Barcelona pulled out, but a promoted Italian club Fiorentina paid the amount and against all common sense, Costa moved, with his reasoning being simple. He loved the club even above his own career and was ready to help them. Costa didn't know it at the time, but he was about to fall in love all over again. With Brian Lodrop, Francesco Biano, Gabriel Battistuta, and Claudio Ranieri at the helm, a sleeping giant was waking up in Florence. Costa was given Roberto Baggio's famous number 10 shirt and quickly emerged as a preeminent alongside Zidane. With beguiling grace and mesmerizing artistry, he was a fully packaged playmaker. He created a telepathic relationship with Batistuta, and in a team that lacked in midfield and defense, the attacking duo became the face of the club and consolidated the reputation as Serie A's most formidable and iconic duo, the complete number 9 and 10. Italian football is traditionally conservative and defense-minded, but Fiorentina built their mid-90s success on the strength of their attack. The duo led the club to two Super Italians and one Italian Super Coppa. What stood out most was how he played. Exquisite close control, dribbling and passes that seemed unreal. He was everything a number 10 could be. He could easily beat an opponent with an almost arrogant ease, a feint of the body or a swivel of the hips, skipping through the traffic of player and for all this, he earned the nickname the Prince of Florence. 
Whenever he had the ball, there was a feeling anything could happen. Such was the unpredictable nature of his game, and he deservedly rivaled Zidane and later Francesco Totti for the title of Serie A's preeminent playmaker. He was the beautiful game incarnate. Overall, Rui Costa made his teammates look good and the opponents inferior and made Serie A a better spectacle to watch among Europe's elite leagues. With Batistuta leaving for AS Roma and Fiorentina encountering financial difficulties of their own, Costa moved on too and joined AC Milan, following Fiorentina manager Fatih Terim in a £44 million deal in 2001. Costa swapped Batistuta for Filippo Inzaghi, while Inzaghi swapped Zidane for Costa, who, upon signing for Milan, made a comment that Rui Costa was better than Zidane. How true is this statement? Well, that will remain an eternal debate in Italian football, similar to Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo now. The two played similar roles, and their overall play was very similar, almost like for like. Zizou was a genius, no doubt about that, but in their prime in Serie A, Costa seemed to excite and appeal more to the fans. When the Frenchman played from his head, Costa played from his heart, and it appealed deeply with the Italian fans. Apart from Inzaghi, Ballon d'Or winner George Weah and Andriy Shevchenko, who played alongside Costa in Milan, heaped praises on the Portuguese international, terming him the best player in the world at the time. In Milan, Costa picked up another nickname, Il Maestro, alluding to the leader of a classical music group or opera. Despite all the good work he put in at AC Milan, he quite never reached the expected levels of a player who two seasons earlier had become the face of Florence, but by no means was it a failed venture. Recurrent injuries meant he did not settle in well from the word go and he struggled to live up to expectations. After a year in Milan with little impact, Costa seemed to be on his way out, with the club even signing Rivaldo as a possible replacement. Unknown to many, the arrival of the Brazilian only acted as an extra bit of competition that would lead him towards one of his greatest seasons ever. He particularly shone brightest in the Champions League, including assisting four goals in a group match against Deportivo La Coruna, leading to the commentator to claim he was three times better than Zidane. He assisted some more, including a famous one against Real Madrid as he went head-to-head -head against Zidane, a match Milan won 1-0. The Italian giants went on to lift the crown, beating Juventus in the finals. Costa added more silverware the following season, winning the European Super Cup as well as the Scudetto, which was missing from his trophy cabinet. However, the arrival of Kaká, who is 10 years younger than Costa, brought a new level of energy to the game that was difficult to resist for Milan manager Carlo Ancelotti. Costa was pushed into a deep-lying role alongside Andrea Pirlo, with Kaká operating behind the attack. He was not so effective in this role. On the international scene, Costa and Portugal's golden generation were not lucky. The 2002 World Cup was meant to be their year, but they had a disappointing campaign, going out of the tournament in the group stages. The 2004 Euro provided the perfect opportunity for Portugal to win silverware. But once again, they came short as they lost in the finals against that Greece side. Costa once promised that he would return to Lisbon and Benfica. He made good on this promise in 2006, deciding to eschew his £4.6 million deal to return to his beloved club, but not before he gave us that iconic photo alongside Marco Materazzi at the San Siro, just before his time in Milan came to an end. After setting Italy alight for over a decade, his best footballing years were way behind him, mainly in Florence, but his presence in his boyhood club would mean everything to the fans. He did not have a lot of time with them though, donning the famous red shirt for two seasons before announcing his retirement. Costa managed to score 10 goals in his final season and his last match came on 11 May 2008 at the Estadio de Lutz against Vitoria de Setubal. Now 14 years later, Rui Costa is the president of Benfica.